start in, make sure, remind me how long I have to wait before I start. Okay, Seth, Seth, we're live and on the air. We're live and on the air, are we? Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> I guess I got that wrong. Welcome to another Hangout with CERN. Um, we are here today to ask about why the LHC is shut down. Because if you look at the LHC status right now, not only does it say um, no beam, but it actually says no beam for about two years, which is not what it usually says. So we're going to talk about that. Um, so let's go right away, actually, to Mike Lamont, who's here with me as an accelerator expert, and he can tell us a little bit about what's going on. Um, OK, yeah, we uh, dumped the last beams. Um, how long ago? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago, yeah. This, this was, uh, having done this year, a proton lead run and then a proton-proton run at low energy uh, for a wrap-up. We've now gone into a two-year two shutdown. Now, the main aim of the shutdown is to consolidate the uh, splices and the superconducting cables that run between magnets out there in the LHC ring. Um, this is a huge job. There's about 1,700 1, interconnects, all of which have to be open. Each interconnect have, has six splices of cables that would bring the currents between the magnets. And the idea is to go in and basically fix a problem that reared its head rather uglily in 2008 on September the 19th. Uh, that problem back then ripped up about 200 meters of the LHC and magnets off their stands, a real mess, and it took us a year to recover from that. So the aim is to fix that problem definitively so we can go happily up to 7 TV when we come back. All right. Well, that's quite a big job ahead of us, um, and we're also going to learn in a bit about um, the experiments, but let's actually start with um, Steve to hear today's uh, quiz, quiz question about the LHC consultant. Well, actually, if you, if you excuse me, Seth, I was just packing up my stuff. I just heard we're down for two years. I thought I'd go take a take a quick <laughs> vacation, and I'll uh, get back to you the next thing, Albert, of 2015. Actually, as you know, as Seth knows, everybody knows here uh, at CERN, we have a lot to do. We have a lot to do on the experiments and on the LAC, and we're going to talk about that. But of course, Seth is right. First of all, the big question. There's a lot of work that's going to happen on the LHC. When that work is complete, we're going to be able to go up to energies never before attained. We're going to have collisions at very high energies. And everybody knows E equals MC squared. That means High energies will be able to produce new particles at higher mass and be able to explore, make things that we have never, ever measured before. So it's very exciting. Now, for the past couple of years, we've had already a lot of excitement. We've explored a lot of terrain. We've tried to answer the big questions. Where's the missing matter? Where's the antimatter? And how, does, how do particles get mass? And it might be that we have... Uh, an answer to that last question. I have an idea for an answer for that. But now to explore, this past year we've been at 4 TeV. Okay, that's 4 trillion electron volts. Right, that's a lot of electron volts. It's a lot of power. That's what we were running at, 4 TeV. That's the energy of one of the beams we collided together and we had AT that the potential of having an eight TeV collision. Okay? So at four TeV, I understand from the experts at the LHC like Mike that we were operating at six thousand eight hundred amps. That's a lot of current. Six thousand eight hundred amps. But now we want to go even higher. Now we can do that because we have superconducting coils made of tight niobium titanium. But we want to go up to from 4 TeV for a beam to 7 TeV for a beam. That means we have to go from 6,800 amps to. That's the question. Put in your answer there, tell us how many amps we have to have to run at 7 TeV. And while you're at it, for extra credit, tell us how many volts are running across these magnets, the dipole magnets. Okay, that's the trivia question. I see Freya is thinking about it very hard, right? You're, you're writing it down, trying to figure out how the calculation. 
uh, trying to remember your 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 uh, undergraduate uh, uh, courses in electromagnetism. So good luck, everybody. Okay, back to you, Seth. All right, terrific. Yeah, put those answers in. Frey is watching to see um, who uh, comes in first. Well, yeah. How do we answer? I'm sorry about that. How do we answer those questions? Where do we? What do we do? Um, how, tell us what we do, Freya. <laughs> Hi guys, so what you do is you can give your answers or any other questions for that matter. You can give them on YouTube or on Twitter with the hashtag AskCern or at the, uh, the CERN Hangout Google Plus page. And I am watching all three of those and uh, give me your answers and ask your questions. Excellent. Perfect. So speaking of questions, um, I want to go now to Anne-Sophie who is a student in France and has been nice enough to join us today. Um, and she has a question she is going to ask us to get us started. So, have the CERN planned uh, new experiments for the LHC when it, uh, when it will work again in 2015? And are these experiments still about the X boson? All right, that is a good question. So. Um, right now, the two experiments that do the Higgs boson searches are um, ATLAS and CMS, and um, Steve is from ATLAS and Freya is from CMS, and... Um, we love each other anyway, Seth. We love each other anyway. <laughs> yeah, let's, um, let's, go, uh, let's go, in fact, to, well, say, Steve, um, is ATLAS done? Are we going to replace Atlas with a new experiment in 2015? What's well, the that's, that's a very good question. In fact, some small parts of Atlas we are going to replace. So it's, it's, it's a good question that Anne Sophie has. Anne Sophie, by the way, where are you in France? France is a big country. I live in France. Where, where are you? In um, I live in the east part of France. It's uh, in a region in a region called uh, Franche-Comté. It's not uh, very known, but it's uh, it's not very far from Belgium. It's uh -huh. uh, two hours away or something like that. Very good. Not, not far from here. Not far from here. Um, okay, so so are we going to replace our experiments is the question. The answer is actually no, to be straightforward. Uh, there won't be new experiments per se. The original experiments, in fact, are built to last a long time. We were designed, all of the, the LHC experiments, we mentioned ATLAS and CMS, there are also LHCB and ALICE, and there are some other smaller experiments uh, that, are, that are placed uh, at our ends, TOTEM and LH, LHCF. Uh, all of these experiments were designed to run at this higher energy. As Mike uh, mentioned, there was a problem early on and we couldn't run at the higher energy. And also, we got a lot of great, great physics at the lower energy. So we're designed to go to higher energy. We uh, will make upgrades in these two years. We will try to uh, make our experiments work better. We have a couple years of experience now. We see where we had some things which could have been designed better or built better, or technology has improved. Uh, you know, Remember, our experiments are prototypes. They've never been built before. So we're always finding things to improve. And we'll be adding areas to our detectors to improve our, our efficiencies and all of that stuff so that we can do even better uh, when we have the new challenge of new energy. So these experiments, they won't be replaced, but some of the parts will be, and they'll be improved uh, to, to take data uh, in the new challenges at higher energy and, and, and higher luminosity. And there's a lot of other upgrades, but why don't we go to Freya? She can tell us perhaps some specifics for CMS. I'd like to know what... I'd like to know from my colleagues, what, are, what do you guys mm -hmm. do? <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. So, uh, yeah, CMS, uh, as Atlas, we have been running for a while. You know when you run a machine, things break. So over time, certain parts are not working as good as they used to anymore. So we are replacing some broken components in practically all parts of the detector, sometimes like a cable who doesn't, that doesn't work anymore. We need to replace it. So on top of that, we are really putting some big improvements in as well. So for example, for the innermost part of our detector, for our tracking uh, detector, we're actually changing some of the 
uh, cooling temperatures, and this has some consequences as well, so we also need to change how we do that. And uh, on top of that, uh, for both our calorimeters, we're fixing some of the readout electronics and some of the calibration, and for our muon system, we're really adding quite a lot of new st stuff even, so it's quite a lot of work, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it will keep us busy the coming years. Yeah. The, the cooling temperatures are actually near and dear to my heart because I work on studying um, the damage that's done to the CMS pixel detector, the very innermost part, um, as from all the particles flying through it all the time because it's really right around the place where the LHC collides. Um, and so the colder we keep it, the slower that damage is. Um, and that's going to be very important for us to keep it running long enough for the day when, in fact, we will completely replace it. But just the pixels won't be re completely replaced this time, um, but we will have to in the future, and we want to keep them in good shape till then. Um, maybe we should go back to Freya now with her, her hat, not as CMS person, but as um, Internet Question Monitor, um, and see, see what people are asking. Yeah, sure, Seth. So we, I, I saw some very interesting questions pass by, actually, already. Um, so the one that I really like very much is actually from Gabriel Levi, or Levi, I don't know how you pronounce it, on YouTube. And I think this is a question from Mike Lamont, actually. So he uh, is wondering, at least Gabriel, I think he's in. Um, he is wondering how the LHC cooling system actually works and what temperature the superconducting magnets work, so, uh, work on. So I think, uh, Mike, you probably can explain that, right? Yeah, so it's a big question. It's a very big system. Um, so this is the cryogenics. Um, the aim is to cool the magnets down to 1.9K. So this is uh, 1.9 degrees above absolute zero, colder than outer space. Um, to do that, enormous cryogenics plants, uh, basically a, a, a staged process of refrigeration so on the surface and underground, um, fill the magnets with helium, liquid helium, and then cool that even further through a very special technique, um, uh, which I won't go into. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so there's about, 100, there's about 150 tons of helium in the system. Uh, 90 tons of that is in this uh, at 1.9 K, and at that temperature, the the helium, the liquid helium, in, it becomes a, a very special uh, type of fluid called a superfluid. It's got remarkably low viscosity and very very high thermal conductivity. It's almost the perfect coolant, and that's that's what we bathe the magnets in, and uh, that's the job of the cryogenic system. There's a, there's people working around the clock on on shift to make sure that, that work is working while the LHC is running uh, to keep the magnets at that temperature. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, how about another question, actually, Freya? Sure. Well, I also have a nice repository because, of course, we also check during the rest of the week if you guys post any good questions. So if you're watching this, on the rerun, make sure to ask your questions because we can answer them online as well, which is what we're going to do now. So um, I uh, would like to actually get the question from uh, uh, Herbert Well, who asked the question on uh, Google Plus, and this is a question I think from the physicist, and uh, well, I know the answer, but I think this time it's for Seth and for Steve, which is. Are the studies at CERN regarding the Higgs boson finished now? I, 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 I've been working pretty hard overnight on something that looked like the Higgs boson to me, but uh, what do you think, Steve? Are we done? I think we, I think we will be, we'll be working on the Higgs boson for the next 20 years, <laughs> from, from numbers I've seen. We, we, we're right now working very, very hard on the Higgs boson, right, Seth? We're, we're preparing uh, for upcoming conferences. This is, this is our motivation. Uh, we, we have to communicate uh, the work that we do. We do that in many ways. We do it here to the public, uh, but we often do it via papers, which we distribute amongst ourselves and read, and also at conferences where we go talk to each other and tell each other what we found. The Higgs, the questions we have right now is, first of all, is it a Higgs boson? You have to wonder why you keep reading all these things where people say, 
Higgs like boson. Can't they make up their mind? What did they find? The truth is we can't. We can't make up our mind. Mother Nature has to tell us. And uh, there are several properties to this boson. Um, one thing I can tell you, we know it's a boson. We knew that right away because of what it decays to. We have basic rules and spin is conserved and we know that we have a boson. But we, we don't know some things about it. We don't know what its spin is. We know it's integral, but we don't know, is it zero? Is it two? Those are both possible, and physics allows that to happen. Uh, what's predicted for the standard model, Higgs boson, is that it has a spin of zero. And so we would like to know if that's the case. And that's really a challenge, because our director general has gone around saying that we will be able to say <laughs> by, by the middle of this year, uh, if that's the case, I hope that's true. We're both both experiments are working extremely hard on that single question. Other questions that come up is what does this particle decay to? And the standard model has certain predictions. It will decay at a certain rate to cert in certain ways. There's different ways that it can decay. Any particle that can decay will decay. In this case, we want to know how it decays and, and to what. And that's a really interesting question because by studying how it decays to other particles, we, we get hints as to whether our model is correct or whether there's a new model that will fit. Right now we've been living off this standard model for years and I can tell you there's at least three frustrated physicists here <laughs> who would love to break that model and find something better, a better model than that. Uh, the standard model has been so incredibly beautiful that it's made predictions such as the top quark's existence and what its mass would be uh, that w came true that the fact that we've cloned a fundamental particle like the top quark didn't even get anybody a Nobel Prize yet. Okay, That's an amazing thing. That means the model is just really, really good. So if the Higgs is useful for us, uh, it could be that it will decay differently than predicted. That would be really great. That would give us a direction to study to figure out if there are other models. And theorists come up with models all the time. Um, and our current model, well, it's nice. It made these predictions. But in some places, it's got a dead end. So we would like those things. So we will continue to study that. And it will take a lot of data uh, to get the precision we need, especially in these different decay channels, uh, to know if there's something new out there. Maybe Seth or Freya, maybe you have something to add to that. I I don't think I have too much to add. I, I'm uh, I work on looking for the Higgs to bottom quarks, which we're we're excited about because we're we're close. I I can say as of the last conference, um, it was clear to us and to everybody else that with the full year's data, we would with sort of no improvements to our analysis, we would be just on the cusp of uh, seeing the Higgs decaying to bottom quarks. Um, and so you, you might imagine, although I can neither confirm nor deny this, we've, we've set out to make some improvements and see, see if we can really get to the point where we say we've seen that, because that would be um, a new, new mode of, of uh, Higgs decay that would tell us whether we do really have a standard model Higgs boson or not. Yeah, why is, why is that important? What's different with, with quarks? You're going to see it decaying to B quarks as opposed to photons and to the Z and W boson. What's, right. what's, so, what's that important? Yeah, so the, the Higgs, um, the, the, Higgs um, the fundamental Higgs mechanism, the reason what it was predicted um, by Peter Higgs and all of the, the other theorists who worked on this, um, was actually for something called electroweak symmetry breaking. So it explained why the W boson, the Z boson, and the photon are different from each other. So it, we are interested in knowing whether um, the Higgs boson is also responsible for the mass of the fermions. It didn't have to be, but we're actually pretty sure already that it is um, because we can see the, these fermions in the production of the Higgs. The rates already we're seeing, even in a few channels, uh, make us strongly suspicious that it really is the standard model Higgs boson. Um, but still, we want to see um, directly, um, directly the uh, the Higgs to bottom quarks. This is something we'll be working on, of course, during the shutdown.
Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I, I am actually one of the physicists who already thought that the Higgs boson was there. I wasn't even that interesting to look at. Is already looking at the next step. So. How oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So maybe we should get back to, to the long shutdown. Uh, what you know, what what we're doing. Are there any more questions about what we're going to do in this long shutdown? Because there's, there's a lot of things going on. Ray, I don't know. Do you have more questions about that? Yeah, I mean, so maybe. Well, yeah, maybe. Like, I'm, I'm scanning through them because I was talking myself, of course. Okay. Yeah. How, how about we actually um, put up this nice slide that we have from CERN of all of the details of what we're um, going to be doing on the LHC during the shutdown, and maybe um, Mike can tell us a little bit more about some of those details. So we can we have the uh, slide page? There you go. I think it's up. Okay. You can you can click on it, Seth, to show it to Mike if you want. Yeah. yeah okay. So yeah, it wasn't going directly to me for some reason, <laughs> but let's see here. Um, so, this is. Yeah. So we, if you if you uh, so this is a view of a small section of the LHC tunnel, and the blue tubes, okay, uh, separated by the silver bits are the, the main dipoles. So these are about 15 meters long, um, joined by a silver bit. The orange magnet is a quadrupole in this in this picture. So we have a regular layout out there in the arc. So one quadrupole, three dipoles, one quadrupole, three dipoles for about three kilometers. And uh, those those silver things are in fact um, bellows, which uh, which are vac uh, uh, you know, vacuum tight. There's a vacuum inside that. And uh, behind, behind those silver bits are the famous interconnects, and those these are the guys that are going to be opened up. Uh, so in one, you can see in picture one, the little red bubble there, you can actually see a uh, a zoom of an interconnect. And one of the, the the beam pipes actually traverse this interconnect, of course, but also traversing the interconnects are the cables carrying the currents between the magnets. So we have. Uh, uh, six cables, two for the focusing quadrupoles, two for the defocusing quadrupoles, and two for the dipoles. So six splices, which you can see in picture two and three um, per per interconnect. And it was one of these splices, which uh, a faulty one of these, which uh, opened up, um, arced, melted a hole in the tube carrying the helium, uh, and released about six tons of helium into the inter into the uh, magnet space. And caused all the damage in 2008. So this is why we're going in and reconsolidating all those splices. And you can see this is basically most of these pictures are describing. You can see this in three and four, the installation of shunts and clamps. And of course, all these uh, have to be checked afterwards that everything is uh, um, electrically good. Um, and when they close up, they have to check that everything's still now vacuum tight. And uh, so yeah, you can do the sums yourself. You can actually see the numbers there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be you know teams of people working shifts five days a week for the next uh, year and a half uh, doing all this work. Mm -hmm. It's really oh. just a lot of sort. It's uh, in a lot of cases it's actually the same thing, even though they're very technical, complex tasks. It's going around all the way around this uh, twenty-seven kilometer ring and. I mean, it's, it, everywhere. it's kind of it's it's uh, it's it's about quality. I, I mean, the actual what's going on there is 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 fairly straightforward soldering job. They got a quite specialized soldering job. It's just mm -hmm. making the the actual resistance in these joints at cold. We are talking nano ohms. I mean, this 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 is these are superconducting cables, and uh, you know we can't afford for those resistances to go high, and okay. uh, so. Job's got to be done well, and then very carefully quality controlled as the process evolves. As the process evolves uh -huh. around the ring, nano ohms. Huh? I think there might have been a hint in there for for our, our bonus <laughs> question. Hmm. For those Let's see. Volts, amperes, and ohms. Hmm. Yeah, they, see relationship in there. But um, be, before before yeah. we hear whether well, anyone got it already, the, the bonus question has not been answered yet. So. Oh wow! Okay. Not been answered. How many bonus volts? Questions. People mm -hmm. can have a have a make a guess or a a an educated guess, shall we say, a back of the envelope estimate. We would say, um, 
to, but before we hear if anyone can get the bonus question or the regular question, um, how about we go back to you, Anne Sophie, and see if you have uh, one more question for us about uh, the shutdown. So, um, since the LHC is going to shut down during two years, we can read on the internet articles about a new kind of uh, collider, the linear collider. I have a question about this because um, the, the good thing with uh, the LHC is that we can make a particle gain lots of energy because it will make uh, several several um, several um, turns in the in the collider. But um, with the linear collider, uh, since the particle won't make uh, circles like this, will the particle gain enough energy? Or uh, because I heard that uh, they would make experiments with the uh, X boson. So since uh, we, the, the, there is a need of lots of energy to to find the X boson, we won't it be a problem, or do we have uh, a good technology now to to do this kind of uh, experiments? All right, good question. All right, so this is really what's the difference between a circular um, storage ring like the LHC and the acceleration techniques in a, a linear collider? Yes, uh, okay, the, the first question, I, I didn't think that you're right. Why would we go for a linear collider? And um, the, the particles we want to we use in the linear collider are electrons and positrons. So these are a lot lighter than protons. And the problem with these guys is because when, when, when we bend them, they emit um, radiation or synchron radiation and lose energy. And the lighter particles use a, lose a lot more energy than the heavy particles. And in the, in the tunnel, the LHC tunnel, we used to have an accelerator called LEP. And we got up to about 100 GeV. We were doing electron positron. We had 100 GeV per, per, per electron, 100 GeV per. per um, per positron and we were colliding them and in one turn of the LHC the, the, an electron lost about 3% of its energy in radiation so it lost 3 GeV and we had to have an awful lot of RF to uh, replace that energy, a lot of accelerating voltage. Now basically this is basically the limit for the circular machines so this is why we've gone, we, we're, we're looking to go linear for the next generation of electron positron colliders and the aim is basically by, by accelerating the, the particles in a straight line, you don't, you don't have this problem with synchron radiation. Now RF technology has come a long way and the accelerating gradients that can be achieved in modern radio frequency cavities uh, have been proven to be able to do the job. And uh, this is it's again a superconducting technology, but the, the, uh, there's a, okay, this is really under debate at the moment about where how much it's going to cost, et cetera, et cetera, right. but uh, very much on the cards for a, a kind of Higgs factory um, to follow on from what the LHC has found. Yeah. I think that will be a lot longer in the future than our, um, our current, current shutdown. Building a, a machine like that will take a long time, and we have a lot more to learn from the LHC um, before we're ready to follow on as well. So it's, it's yeah, I think that we're, we're, we'll be looking for a kind of, even if we started now, it would be about 15, 20 years before this uh, a machine like that could come online, if you can find the political willpower to come up with the necessary money. <laughs> oh. so, so there's, a, there's a kind of cycle that happens in our field uh, with accelerators. Uh, we had, uh, in the early 80s, we discovered uh, the W and Z boson. We did that with a proton, actually it was proton-antiproton collider. Uh, and when you when you collide protons, you never really know exactly what your energy is going to be at the collision point, right? So I guess you're 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 searching a big area to discover something, and then after that, we built in this tunnel we have out here, LEP. And LEP took electrons and positrons and collided them. And since those are elementary particles, we could operate exactly at a specific energy and produce those particles we discovered, like mm -hmm. Z or the W later on, we produced a couple W's. Now we're in the discovery stage again with protons out here in the LHC and 
the next idea is, hey, why don't you build, among other things, a factory where you produce, you sit with electrons and positrons on the resonance of your discovery, for example, the Higgs. I guess I guess there's a pattern that we do in, in this field now. Sounds good. So we, we should wrap up soon, but let's go to Freya for one more question from uh, the internet. Yeah, hi. Uh, there are some really good questions, actually, actually, including some very entertaining ones. So I'm having a great time. So keep the questions coming. Uh, Jonathan Langdale has a lot of questions. Uh, some of them are obviously, I think he's more interested in the social aspect of uh, particle physics, which is cool. I think it's really interesting as well. And one of the ones that I really liked was that he I was actually wondering if anyone is going to be really bored during the shutdown. And he asked us to be honest about this. So guys, are we going to be really bored? No. <laughs> we of being bored. <laughs> yeah. that, that would be we have a lot to do. We have, I mean, for people really who are doing physics, we're going to spend some of our time Stuck around. We didn't mean to go away. We had a little glitch. Uh, these things happen. Yes, we still uh, need to do the competition, uh, and yeah. I still have a really cool question. Okay, so we're, let's go back to your question there, Freya. Yeah, so there is a question, and I know Anne Sophie has this question as well. Uh, so, Anne Sophie, do you want to ask it? I, there's at least like 10 people who have asked something similar on, uh, on either YouTube or Google Plus or Twitter. So, Anne Sophie, it's a Susie question. Okay, so about uh, the supersymmetry, did uh, any particles have uh, have been found uh, thanks to the uh, LHC, or will and uh, will the, the improvements of uh, the LHC will help to, will help to find them? Okay, 
No, no. <laughs> we have we have another conference next week. We can't we can't quite tell you uh, how, how things look for it just yet. Okay. Uh, we, we continue to search, and we will. Um, have you? Did you we, see anything so far? As of the last conference updates we did, we hadn't seen anything. <laughs> yet. Okay. Um, what's, a but, what's a Spartacle? First, we should say what is a Spartacle? So all right. It has nothing to do with Spartacus, right? It's a Spartacle. Right. Or, or with sparkling, it turns out, I've or been sparkling. asking for. They don't sparkle especially. Um, the, so what's, what's a sparticle? Yeah, what's a sparticle? Yeah, a sparticle, it stands for supersymmetric particle. So this is all about supersymmetry, which is the idea that there's uh, more or less a, a complete extra set of particles that is based on an extra symmetry in our universe. And it's a relatively compelling theory because, for one thing, as you might be aware, there are uh, we have measured what is in our universe, and 94% of it uh, we don't really know what it is, and so we call this dark matter part of that. And supersymmetry is one of the th theories, which is really still a theory. It's, we haven't we haven't found it yet, but it's one of the ways there could we could make a dark matter particles in the universe. So this is, of course, very compelling. Um, up to now, uh, both ATLAS and CMS, and actually also indirectly LHCB, have been looking for supersymmetry. And actually, the previous generation of experiments has also been looking for supersymmetry, because supersymmetry has been a while, around for a while. And it sort of rears its ugly head every once in a while. And at the moment, we are completely done analyzing the data from 2011. I think both ATLAS and CMS are now done with 2011. So there's the whole 2012 data set that we still have to look at. Yes, so that's we've uh, already looked at, but not everywhere. So I think this is already giving you some idea that we're definitely not going to be sleeping during the shutdown, because we still have all this old data we need to look at. Exactly. So it, it takes two years per year, it sounds like. So yeah. by the end of the shutdown, we can be done with 2012. And then we can start getting ready for, for the new data that we'll collect in 2015. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's a really good a question answer. About this, like uh, this, the LHC at like full operation uh, uh, energy, will it actually be able to exclude Susie? And I, I should take uh, credit. So this was Keith Wright who had this question. He, uh, he asked it slightly differently, but that's his question. He said, is the top theoretic uh, LHC luminosity suitable to exclude Susie? But uh, uh, so. Or, or, or prove it as well. So uh, maybe, uh, Steve, you want to answer that. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. It, Susie comes in many different flavors. So Susie is this, this theory, as you mentioned. And actually, to, to be fair, to be fair to the theorists uh, who came up with, with Susie, we have indeed found half of the supersymmetric particles. And, then, and that's, that's the standard model. Uh, but they, they predict another half. For each fermion, a boson. For each boson, a fermion. And and as Freya said, it's it's, it's a very compelling model uh, because uh, it 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 can answer some of the questions we have as, as to why we have to put in so many parameters. We still have a lot of parameters we have to measure, and they're not predicted by the standard model. And Susie helps to to resolve that. That was what it was designed for. In the meantime, though, our our colleagues in astrophysics did come up with this problem which is that we're missing most of our universe. Uh, as Freya said, there's this, something like 94% of, of mass energy, we can't account for it. Oops. And, uh, and that means actually about 80% of matter. We learned that by looking at galaxies and their spin, and we know how fast they're spinning that they should fall apart, but there must be something in there. Now, to get to the, of course, I'm not trying to avoid the question, I'm just trying to avoid the question because <laughs> it's a hard one. Uh, the, you know, supersymmetry has different, uh, there's, there's different forms of supersymmetry, there's different models. Some of those models, I think, indeed, uh, by the time the LHC is done, we will have been able to exclude them. And you mentioned the measurement by LHCB. They did a very beautiful measurement uh, in, in looking uh, for a very rare decay, which was uh, a B. Pun uh, intended there, Steve, with yes, beautiful, a beautiful measurement. A strangely beautiful measurement. Uh, B sub S going to a, to, to a muon pair. And that's allowed in the standard model, but at a very, very low rate, one in a trillion or something like this. Okay, But that doesn't bother us anymore since we found the Higgs, and that was also a one in a trillion kind of thing. Uh, so they found this measurement and uh, and saw that the rate that came out 
was what was predicted by the standard model alone. And that already starts to put some restrictions on certain bits of this of SUSY, of supersymmetry. So some of the areas uh, are mapped out. We, we don't have to look in that region anymore. And it's much, much like uh, you know NASA or ESA looking out in space, looking in different areas, and being able to say, we've mapped out that galaxy. We know that region. We don't have to look there anymore. Let's go on to other places. I suspect, though, that even if we don't find evidence for supersymmetry by the end of the LHC, there will still be some small areas where it, it could exist. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Wow. It sounds like we all have our work cut out for us. Um, we should start to wrap up, so let's go to Freya and see if anyone answered our quiz question and our bonus question. Yeah, so I still have not seen anyone who actually has met, uh, answered our bonus question. Um, but there was somebody already very quickly actually who uh, figured out uh, the, the, the main question, which is CM for Slavs. So you're lucky that I know how to pro uh, pronounce that. Uh, already at 3 plus 5. Huh? Uh, and he said uh, 11,900 amps. That's uh, that's close enough, I would say. It's somewhere in the in the ballpark of 12,000. Uh, 12, so uh, well done, CM for Slimes. Hey. Um, I have another question which I saw pass by, and I think that's a really nice question um, to close with, which is uh, somebody asked, hey, Steve, who's that person behind you? Who's the person <laughs> behind me? Well, I have two people behind me. I have a director and a producer who are behind me. Okay, we have a, we have a new we have a we have a new producer, Kelly. Is that come come say hi? Come on up here and say hi. They're not, they're not hiding. They're hiding. There's Kelly. Hey. She's our producer today. She's helping us get keep things going. Sorry here. for the technical difficulties. We got <laughs> And we have a Chintia, our director. And Chintia loves to come up in front of the camera and say hi. Don't don't you? Here's a Chintia. <laughs> It always makes everything work technically, and we owe a lot to him. It was his brilliant idea to get on Google and learn how to use these Hangouts. So many thanks to these two for, for all of their good work. And they've been putting up the slides and things like that. So there's the answer to that question. Yeah. So well, should we I, give our hug? I think we should give our hug. Yes, a virtual hug to the answer. <laughs> oh, this um, is yeah. <laughs> hey, good job. Right. <laughs> oh boy. Twelve thousand again every every week we do this. Um, good. Well you come up with something else so we can send them virtually. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how about we um we thank um Aunt Sophie for joining us and and um asking your very good questions. And Aunt Sophie. Thanks, thanks for everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It's really nice of you. And thank you for all your answers. It's uh, it's really nice. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and, and maybe, should we give him the answer? Mike, Mike Lamont, so, so uh, j just to make sure the blame goes where blame is due, uh, is the one who gave me the, the, the answer for the voltage. So maybe Mike, do you want to tell us what's the answer for what is the voltage of these magnets? Yeah, so so uh, one one power supply driving a hundred current through 154 dipoles is about, has about t uh, generates about 10 volts generates the current by putting about 10 volts across the circuit. So if you divide uh, uh, voltage by current, you get resistance, and you're in the milliohm range for the whole string of magnets. So this is the beauty of superconductivity. Very good. So it doesn't take 10 volts. That's it. Go out, buy a 10 volt battery, and you're all set, right? Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, so, Steve, would you like to um, give us our um, preview of our fu future events and uh, more information about the Hangouts and all that good stuff to uh, conclude? Sure. Okay. So, just to finish up, we're going to have some great events. Uh, next, The next two weeks will be dedicated to a conference which is known to all of us as Morion, which is a place uh, in the Alps. And for some strange reason, Morion is actually going to be at a place called La Tuile, which is a different place in the Alps. But uh, the, the conference got its name because of the, the uh, first time that they met was in Morion. It's actually called the Rencontre de Morion. And the, the reason for that is a place where it was meant to be a little bit less formal. People were supposed to meet there and discuss their ideas. And they, they try to maintain that informality. They have meetings in the morning. 
quick skiing in the afternoon, and then they come back to meetings in the evening. So they try to get people to really interact. You have people from accelerators, people from the, the um, experiments there, theorists there. We try to keep them off the slopes, but there are theorists there. And uh, they will talk next week about uh, electroweak physics. So that includes mainly the Higgs and, and, and other measurements in the electroweak era, uh, uh, area. And uh, we will have uh, Pauline Gagnon. You've met Pauline a few times. Uh, she's from Indiana University from Atlas. And uh, she uh, will be in Morian. She'll be our, our uh, correspondent on the scene. She'll report from there. And uh, the following week, we're going to go to, uh, to QCD. So Morian has a second week, which is on QCD. Bye, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, bye, okay. Mike. He had to go um, <laughs> pick his daughter up. I had to pick my daughter up. Oh, I was in deep trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can't be late for that. Can't right. be late for that. I know that so feeling. So, so anyway, the, the following week after that, we'll continue and we'll talk about that. What's interesting about the fact that we're talking about a conference, we're going to talk about physics. We're going to get into the physics. What's being presented? And you are going to, by being in our hangout, you're going to be the first to know what's going on at the LHC. What are the results being being presented, and so that should be very interesting. I'm looking forward to watching those. That's terrific. So that's, okay. that's it. Um, shall we shall we roll the credits before we um, say goodbye to everyone? Okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. No credits. There's no credits. No credits today. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much to all our viewers, and um, we'll look forward to talking to everyone next week about okay. what we've found lately. All okay. right. Thank you. So Bye, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Thank you for joining. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks, Anne Sophie. Thank you.